Welcome again. In this lecture, I'm going to cover, talk about epidural analgesia. Please note that I divided the talk into two parts. Um, in part one, we'll learn about uh, anatomy, um, uh, the epidural kit, the surgical effect, advantage, indication, contraindication, and how to assess epidural patients. In part two, we'll go in more detail in the technique, medications, special considerations for uh, labor epidural, and troubleshooting side effect and complication. So make sure you watch to the two uh, parts. Let's start by anatomy. So, if you look here, the vertebral column usually consists of seven cervical, twelve thoracic, five lumbar, and five fused sacral and on average about four fused coccygeal vertebrae. What's important also to uh, know that <clears throat> you have two lordotic area and two kyphotic area normally on the spine. So the cervical and the lumbar region, the concave uh, uh, they concave posteriorly, and this is called lordosis. While the thoracic and sacral region, they concave anteriorly, and this is called kyphosis. C5, about here, and L3, uh, compromise the highest point of lordosis, while the highest point of kyphosis are about um, T5 and uh, S2. And in normal people, you should see a straight back. If, if it's deviated to the right or to the left, that's called scoliosis. Let's learn about the vertebrae itself. So, as you notice on the uh, right side of the slide, you have the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae. So, the cervical, the cervical um, is the smallest among the three. Uh, thoracic is uh, quite larger and um, lumbar is the largest. Uh, when it comes to the weight, uh, same concept. Um, when it comes to transverse foramen, it's important to notice that um, in the cervical, there is a transverse foramen uh, in the transverse process here. While this is not the case in the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. The spinous processes um, on the cervical uh, usually have a cylinder and a pivot spinous uh, processes, if you notice here. That's not the case in the lumbar and uh, thoracic and lumbar. Um, when it comes for um, articular uh, facet, uh, or let's talk about the facet first. So the facet, um, if you look at the uh, body of the uh, vertebrae, you will see um, two uh, prominent facets in the body itself of the vertebrae. Um, you will see a smaller facet 
when it comes to the thoracic, but you will not see facet uh, in, the, in the lumbar. Facet in the lumbar is outside the uh, vertebrae. It's in this area. Uh, articular facet for ribs only uh, uh, present with uh, thoracic. And when you look at the spinal canal width, it's uh, despite the cervical is a small vertebrae, but you have a, a decent uh, width and, and many times more than even uh, the thoracic. And you, we will see why in the next slide. Two important uh, terminology here, sacralization, which is when the last lumbar vertebrae uh, fused with the sacrum, like L5 fused with the sacrum, and lumbarization when S1 or S2, which is supposed to be completely fused, in this case is incompletely fused, making the numbering uh, uh, so confusing sometimes because sometimes you have, uh, you think you have more lumbar uh, vertebrae. Now, let's take a close look at the uh, uh, vertebrae. So if you look at the cervical vertebrae, this is, this is C1 or the atlas. Again, notice the, the transverse foramen in the transverse process here. And um, C1 does not have uh, spinous uh, processes. Uh, while if you look at C2, or the axis, it does have a pivot uh, a spinous, uh, spinous processes, which is an important landmark. Then if you go in the lower uh, cervical vertebrae, uh, they don't have the pivoted uh, spinous processes, but they have a longer uh, spinal uh, processes. And again, notice the the transverse foramen in the, in the body of the, attached to the body of the vertebrae. Now this is uh, L5 vertebrae. Uh, again, um, if you look higher at the back, this is the um, uh, um, superior articulate process. This is the uh, inferior articulate process. This is the uh, spinous process here. And here, and here, this is the lamina, and here is the pedicle, and this is the body. Now, if you look at the sacrum, again, you will have one, two, three, four, five, usually fused uh, vertebrae with four uh, uh, neural foramen. So the neural foramen, um, this, is the, this is the dorsal, and if you have also anterior, usually uh, opening. Uh, this is the sacral canal here, and this is the articular surface with the, with the ilium, which makes the sacroiliac joint. And at the end here, you will see the coccyx, which is usually anywhere between three to five, fused uh, small vertebrae, in this case, uh, um, four. And this is the sacral hiatus. And this tiny bone here and here, this is the sacral cornea. Now, this is also an, an important slide. I like this slide. Um, the adult cord, uh, measure about uh, 45 centimeter or about 18 inch and it has two regions of uh, enlargement. Uh, the first region uh, at uh, C2 um, uh, to C2 and this is the cervical enlargement. The second enlargement is at about T9 or L2, it's 
many cases smaller than that. Um, areas that correspond with the origin of the nerve uh, supply to the upper and lower extremity. However, its level of termination varies with age as well as among individuals of similar age group. Uh, as a result of uh, discrepancy um, in the pace of growth of the spinal cord and vertebral column during development, the spinal cord at birth usually end at L3, uh, about age of anywhere between uh, 6 and 12 months, it, um, because of the growth of the baby, it ends up as L2, uh, which is uh, what the adult uh, level is. <clears throat> Below, you have the conus medullaris, conus medullaris here, and um, long dorsal and ventral root of all spinal nerve below L1 form a bundle known as cauda equina. So cauda equina, all of these nerves here, uh, or horse's tail, which is a collection of uh, strands of neuron-free uh, fibrous tissue uh, enveloped in pia uh, matter compromises the filium uh, terminali and extend from the inferior tip of the conus medullaris to the second or third uh, sacral uh, 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 vertebrae, so to S2 or to uh, S3. Now, uh, a couple of quick uh, notes here, not necessarily related to uh, epidural analgesia, but mostly um, if we are in the chronic pain field, if you ever wonder why we place um, the spinal cord uh, stimulator at uh, these levels, because we are, and, and how come we end up with uh, uh, covering the lower extremity, because we are close to the lumbar uh, enlargement. The other concept uh, which I like to to pay attention to, if you look at the nerve root that's leaving between the uh, uh, the vertebrae. So if you look at the nerve root that's leaving between L4 and L5, this is L4. So. If you ever see a foraminal stenosis between L4 and L5, so the patient usually have uh, uh, L4 uh, uh, symptoms. Sorry, L5 symptoms, the, low, uh, the level below. However, um, the, my, my, my point here, if you have a canine stenosis, you, will, you can have uh, symptoms at the same level, so let's say L3, or below, even below for a few segments. And, and the reason why, because you have all this counter equina and um, all these bundles of nerve fibers that supply the lower extremities. Now, let's talk about ligamentum flavum. So if, if you look at the picture here, uh, you have... Um, in the, in the right side of the slide. <clears throat> if I add here for you um, subcutaneous tissue and skin, then you think about the layers you go through. Uh, you have here the uh, uh, supraspinous ligament, and then you have here the interspinous ligament, and you have here the ligamentum flavor. So if you put your needle, you go through the skin, subtenous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, then dura. That's when we are talking about uh, midline approach. So ligamentum flavum is very important landmark when you are doing neuroaxial procedure, uh, whether epidural or spinal. Ligamentum flavum is a, a connect, 
connect the lamina of the adjacent vertebrae from the inferior border of C2 all the way down to the superior border of S1. Laterally, it extends into the intervertebral foramina where it join the uh, capsule of the articular process. Areas of ossification of the ligamentum flavum occur at different levels of the vertebral canal and appear to be a normal uh, variant. Its thickness varies at different levels, thinnest in the cervical level. Um, in isolated uh, a pregnant patient, the ligament of flavum has been reported to be as thick as 10 millimeter breathing millimeter due to edema. Midline ligament of flavum gap formed by the incomplete fusion of the right and left uh, flavor. This is a very important concept. Uh, so up to 75%, you will see gap midline gap in the ligament of flavum and the cervical region. Up to 35% between T10 and T11, up to 22% between L1 and L2, and it decreases as we go caudally. Um, so about 11% at L2 to L4, about 10% between uh, uh, between L4 and L5, and uh, none between L5 and S1. And this comes at a different uh, uh, shape. So here you have a, a full midline uh, fusion of ligament of flavum. Here you have a caudal gap for passing of the vessels. Here you have a continuous gap, and here you have a continuous gap uh, that uh, widens caudally. And why is this is important? Because if you think about that, if you are putting your needle midline and you go there, then you will not have loose resistance uh, of the ligament of flavum because you are going through the gap. So be thoughtful about this. Um, not always you will um, feel that classic give uh, or pop when you go through the ligament of flavum um, for multiple reasons. One of them that you actually might be going through uh, uh, the gap. Another important thing I would like to bring to your attention is the plica mediana dorsalis. Um, this is an old study, however, still relevant. So plica mediana dorsalis is a midline ligament in the epidural space. If we look here, there is a ligament here that split the epidural space into half. Um, it's interesting that this, um, this is usually thought to be rare. However, um, from my experience with doing epidural uh, under fluoro for chronic pain, uh, you'll be surprised uh, how many times uh, you see this view. So you inject a contrast, then you notice, oh, it's only, uh, it's only in one side, and you will see a very clear line demarcating the contrast. Um, there is no studies uh, I could find that determine the, the incidence. As you can see, this is, uh, or the prevalence, this is not uh, something commonly studied, but it is something that you should keep in mind. There are a var variety of uh, different uh, 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 pattern, as we see here, but you get the idea. Now, let's talk about spinal meninges. So spinal meninges cover the cord and nerve root and continuous fashion from the cranial meninges that surround and protect uh, the brain. Uh, the tough, predominantly uh, collagenous out, uh, outermost layer uh, called the dura 
uh, matter, which is in this uh, picture in the gray color, and includes the CNS and provides localized point of attachment to the skull, sacrum, and vertebrae to anchor the spinal cord within the vertebral canal. Cranially, the spinal dura mater fuses with periosteum at the level of foramen magnum. Caudally, it fuses with uh, elements of the filium terminale and contributes to formation of uh, coccygeal ligaments. Laterally, the dura mater surrounds nerve root as they exit the intervertebral uh, foramen. The dura mater uh, touches the spinal canal in areas but does not adhere to it except in pathologic condition. It also confers both permeability and mechanical resistance to the dural sac, which terminate at um, S1 uh, in adult and S3 in uh, a newborn. The spinal nerve uh, root uh, uh, cuff, uh, which uh, have been postulated to play a role in the uptake of epidural administered local anesthetic, are lateral projections of both the dura mater and the underlying arachnoid lamina. Clifts may form at the arachnoid dura interf uh, uh, interface as a result of mechanical stress and direct trauma. Injection of a large volume of local anesthetic intended for the epidural space in this area may result in subdural nerve block. And we will see that when we talk about uh, suboptimal epidural uh, analgesia. So the layers here that you need to pay uh, attention for is, uh, again, the dura matter here, which is in gray. Then underneath that, you have the arachnoid which is in uh, dark uh, green. And underneath that, you have the pia matter, uh, which is in the light uh, uh, green. And notice here, your nerve root, and with this uh, swelling, this is called the DRG, or the dorsal root uh, ganglion. Now, let's learn about the epidural space. So, if you look here on this picture, um, the yellow color, like this yellow color, all the way, I don't want to uh, miss the um, picture, but all this yellow color surrounding the dura matter circumferentially extend from the foramen magnum to the sacrococcygeal ligament. This is called the epidural space. The space is bound posteriorly by the ligamentum Flavum, which is this guy here, and laterally by the pedicles um, and the intervertebral uh, foramen. So all this area is an intervertebral foramen, and anteriorly by the posterior ligamental segment in this area. And of the three epidural spaces, compartment, posterior, lateral, anterior, so this is uh, posterior, uh, and this is lateral, and uh, this is anterior here. The posterior epidural space is most relevant for the perioperative pain management where we usually put our needle here. Uh, we can access the lateral epidural and sometimes the anterior or ventral in a few situations uh, when we are doing uh, chronic pain management or sometimes doing uh, epidural blood patch. The epidural space uh, in general contain adipose uh, tissue, blood vessels, nerve roots, and loose connective uh, tissue. 
blood supply, vertebral, we have two types. We have vertebral, we have segmented arteries supply the spinal cord. A single anterior, single anterior spinal artery and two posterior spinal arteries arise from the vertebral arteries and supply the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord and the uh, posterior one-third from the uh, two posterior spinal artery. The artery of uh, Adam Quick is among the largest segmented artery and is most commonly unilateral, mostly on the left side uh, of the aorta and between T8 to L1. The venous system, you have anterior posterior spinal veins, which anastomose with the internal vertebral plexus and the epidural space, drain into the azagus and hemizagus and internal iliac vein, among other segmental veins via intervertebral veins. The, inter the internal vertebral venous plexus consists of two anterior and two posterior longitudinal vessels with a variable distribution and is suggested to be involved in uh, bloody or traumatic epidural needle and catheter uh, uh, placement. Sympathetic nervous system. The preganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers originate in the spinal cord from L1 to L2 and are blocked to varying degree during epidural uh, anesthesia and analgesia. There are potential benefits and market drawback to epidural blockade of the sympathetic nervous system. Thoracic epidural analgesia appear to increase GI motility by blocking the sympathetic supply to the inferior mesenteric ganglion thereby reduce the incidence of postoperative ileum. Epidural anesthesia may also uh, nerve block the sympathetic stress response to surgery in part by blockage of the sympathetic nervous system. Cranial and sacral components compromise the parasympathetic nervous system. The vagus nerve provides parasymp uh, parasympathetic innervation to a broad area, including the head, neck, the thoracic organs, and part of the digestive tract. Parasympathetic innervation of the bladder, the descending large intestine, and the rectum originate at the spinal cord level between uh, S2 and S4. Now, let's learn about a few important skeletal landmarks when we uh, try to do uh, neuroaxial uh, anesthesia, and in, in this case, uh, epidural uh, analgesia. So, um, you have to learn and you have to know this landmark. So, C7 is the most uh, prominent cervical vertebra, right here. And then you have T3, which is the spine of the scapula. And then you have T7, which correspond to the uh, inferior angle of the scapula. And then you have L1, which is the rib margin, uh, the lower rib margin, 10 centimeters. So this is um, uh, T12, uh, uh, or the, the lowest uh, rib margin, if you draw a line here that should be uh, L1. And then superior aspect of iliac crest, usually uh, L4, and the space between them L4, L5. And then another important landmark is the posterior superior iliac spine. Posterior superior iliac spine here. Um, which uh, we will learn 
uh, uh, later on the posterior superior sorry the posterior superior iliac spine here in this area uh, that's uh, uh, S2 again in lateral position that's uh, posterior superior iliac spine that's the iliac crest and this is L2 L1 with the lower rib uh, T7 with the inferior angle of the scapula and the most uh, prominent uh, cervical uh, vertebrae is C7. Dermatomes, it's very important to know the dermatomes, especially when you want to assess the epidura. I highlighted a few for you here that I think you have to memorize. So C6 is the thumb. C8 is the little finger, L1 is the upper anterior thigh, and uh, T4 nipple, T6 Z4 process, T10 umbilicus, L5 is the big toe, and S1 is the lateral aspect of the foot. If we memorize this, then you should be good. And you can extrapolate the areas between them. Okay, we're done with um, anatomy. Uh, if you think that was too much anatomy, I would like to assure you that you will need this. Um, and you will find this helpful the more you do epidural because it will help you to understand uh, the technique troubleshoot your epidural and to understand the physiological changes complication etc now let's take a quick look at the epidural needles and kit you should familiarize yourself with whatever you have at your institute but you need to know that there are a uh, few uh, or uh, little more uh, out there so there are a bunch of uh, companies that uh, manufacture the epidural needles and kits so for example this is uh, from uh, parifix by no means i'm recommending anyone i just want you to be familiar with that so the epidural needle it comes at different sizes um uh, 22 20 um this should be 19 and 18 gauge and it come at different lengths two inch three inch two and a half three and a half four inch four and a half and uh, six inches uh, uh, again you have most of the epidural which we will be using for epidural analgesia is will be a straight needle uh, some of them they have this curved here this is called the code um, this is mostly used for um, spinal cord uh, lead uh, uh, placement and if you look at inside the the uh, tray uh, there are uh, different syringes here and some of them came with a plastic LOR loser for resistance syringe uh, some kit use uh, glass um, the filter is also uh, 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 different but the connector is uh, quite different so watch this one uh, versus uh, this one for example and then uh, the, but, but overall it's it's very similar so this is the the brown uh, they have an 18 gauge needle three and a half two heat and an arrow they have 17 gauge uh, also uh, three and a half uh, too. So make sure you familiarize yourself with uh, with the kit. Now let's learn about a uh, physiological effect of epidural blockade. Uh, the extent of these physiologic effects depend on the level of uh, placement and the number of spinal segment uh, blocked. In general, high thoracic epidural nerve block, like above. Um, T5 
and the extensive epidural nerve block are associated with more profound uh, physiological changes than nerve block with low sensory level like below um, T10. So central nervous system, uh, when you use uh, epidural analgesia uh, during anesthesia, um, it will have some sedative effect from the medication and it's well known to reduce your MAC. The degree of sedation and uh, MAC sparing um, effect appear to correlate with the height again and the level of the sensory nerve block. Um, uh, while if you do uh, middle thoracic, of course, uh, it have a, a more uh, uh, effect than uh, lower lumbar, for example. Cardiovascular and hemodynamics, primarily from blockade of sympathetic nerve fiber conduction. I hope you still remember that uh, uh, picture. Uh, these changes include venous and arterial uh, vasodilation, reduce uh, SVR, changes in uh, chronotropy and inotropy, and associated alteration in blood pressure and cardiac output. More marked increase in venous uh, capacitance occur, uh, hypotension, with blockade of the sympathetic outflow to the splanchnic uh, veins when you block the segment between uh, T6 uh, to L1 due to dilation of the extensive splank link uh, uh, bed. When cardiac sympathetic fiber from T1 to L uh, so to T4 are blocked, so this is called the cardiac sympathetic fibers from T1 to T4, then you will have a decreased cardiac contractility and bradycardia, resulting in decreased cardiac output. Potential uh, beneficial effects include improved myocardial blood flow, myocardial oxygen balance, and tissue oxygenation, especially with high thoracic epidural. Some studies indicate that coronary artery blood flow is improved with thoracic epidural analgesia. Pulmonary, in general, tidal volume remain unchanged even during high neuroaxial nerve block, while vital capacity may be reduced due to the decrease in expiratory reserve volume that occur as accessory muscles involved in expiration are blocked. Higher sensory levels may result in more marked changes in the lung function. However, multiple studies showed benefits in major abdominal thoracic surgery because you have less pain that will improve your respiration mechanics and uh, ability to cough. Gastrointestinal, the sympathetic outflow to the GI tract arrives between T5 to T12. Anyone can remember the sympathetic outflow for the cardiovascular from where? Exactly, T1 to T4, GI, T5 to T12, while parasympathetic is the, 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 uh, the vagus. Sympathetic to me, associated with epidural blockade in the mid to low thoracic level, results in an opposed vagal tone, which manifests clinically with increased peristasis, relaxed sphincters and increased GI secretion, and more rapid restoration of GI motility in the post-operative phase. Thoracic epidural may decrease the risk of anastomotic leak and improve perioperative intestinal perfusion, although this is controversial. Uh, numerous ex uh, uh, experimental and clinical Studies have demonstrated that thoracic epidural protect against splanchnic hypoperfusion and reduce postoperative ileus. However, similar benefits are not seen with lumbar epidural. So, if you are putting a low lumbar epidural, do not expect that it will give you this benefit. Now, renal and gastro and genitourinary, 
because renal blood flow is maintained through autoregulation, epidural anesthesia and analgesia has little effect on renal function in healthy individual. Epidural blockade at lumbar level may impair control of bladder function secondary to blockade of uh, 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 S2 and uh, S4 nerve root. So be thoughtful about that. But however, it really needs to be a low number to get there. Neuroendocrine, the surgical stress response can be influenced by sympathetic blockade during epidural blockade. The mechanism involved are not fully established, but most likely include both direct blockade of afferent and efferent signals during surgical stress and direct effect of local anesthetic agent. Thermoregulation, hypothermia occur frequently in neuroaxial analgesia or anesthesia. Neuroaxial anesthesia inhibits central thermoregulatory control. More importantly, blockage of the peripheral sympathetic and motor nerve prevent vasoconstriction and shivering. Coagulation system. The post-operative period is marked hypercoagulable state. Neuroaxial blockade is associated with decreased risk of DVT and pulmonary embolism. This is documented multiple times in multiple studies. Advantage, again, there are multiple studies, multiple meta-analysis that shows um, that epidural analgesia is superior to systemic opioid administration, including PCA, and there is a clinically significant difference, especially in the first two post-operative days, they might get closer because they have less pain. Uh, potential benefit, as we see when we learned about the physiological uh, effect, so analgesia is a big thing. It's superior to most available uh, uh, modalities. Cardiovascular, as we saw, it reduced the risk of myocardial infarction and dysarrhythmia. Gastrointestinal hernia bowel return, less ileus. Pulmonary reduced risk of post operative pulmonary complication, plus lower risk of surgical um, uh, stress and the effect in coagulation, we saw that. The efficacy of epidural analgesia, however, is determined by a few factors. Again, the site, um, the choose of uh, which drug you are using, the rate of infusion, whether you're using boluses or not with that, and the duration of epidural analgesia. Let's learn about indications and contraindications. So indications are wide, but this uh, uh, table from Nysura summarizes um, most of them. So if, if you look at orthopedic surgery, any major hip, knee surgery, pelvic fracture, um, obstetric uh, C-section is a big thing, laparanalgesia, uh, gastrointestinal hysterectomy, pelvic, general surgery, anywhere from the breast, hepatic, gastric, colon surgery, especially, uh, especially open surgery, uh, pediatric surgery, uh, ambulatory surgery, uh, cardiothoracic, like thoracotomy, esophagectomy, thymectomy, Again, uh, mostly for open surgeries. Uh, urology, uh, prostatectomy, cystectomy, the same thing. Vascular and plenty of medical conditions like autonomic high bar reflexia, mycenae gravis, fucromocytoma. Um, more specifically here, if you want to look at thoracic, uh, again, uh, open thoracotomy, pectus repair, thoracic aneurysm, uh, thymectomy, upper abdominal, lower abdominal, uh, urology and gynecology, plenty of major painful procedures. And when it comes to contraindication, generally speaking, we divide them to absolute and relative. And again, you will see 
there is no consensus of this in the literature, but absolute, when patients refuse that absolute contraindication, when you have a severe coagulation. When it comes to relevant um, sepsis, elevated recranial pressure, anticoagulation, thrombocytopenia, and even in thrombocytopenia here, there is really no consensus. However, uh, most of the references, they uh, go with uh, 70,000. So, but again, it's, it's provider uh, uh, difference and institutional difference. And I would say it's patient difference. If you see a patient uh, with uh, easy spine and you think this will be an epi easy epidural, it's not like when you see a patient with scoliosis and this will be a challenging epidural and you might need to do a multiple passes. So all of this uh, determine uh, your level. But uh, most of the uh, anesthesiologists go anywhere between 50,000 uh, to 70,000, maybe 70,000 you are more in the uh, safe side. But again, it's case by case. Pre-existing uh, uh, central nervous system disorder, fever, preload, uh, previous back surgery, placement in aesthetic adult, and tattoo. Here I, I added this central canal stenosis. It's not mentioned, but from my experience, this is very important, especially when you have severe central canal stenosis. You really don't have um, much space on there. And you can have problem by two means. Either when you put the catheter, you don't have much space, you can cause uh, neurological injury. Or when you start the infusion, again, you don't have much space there, so that pressure can exacerbate the symptoms. So be thoughtful about that, um, especially in patients with known uh, um, chronic lower back pain with neurogenic claudication. Now, uh, speaking of uh, 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 antithrombotic therapy, uh, I, I recommend, I personally recommend you, you download the Azra um, app and uh, you look up the medication. Um, it's a very nice app. However, this is a very nice table also from Nysura that um, summarizes most of the commonly used uh, anti-thrombotic, anticoagulant medication. So NSAIDs, as you see, um, you can proceed. Plavix, you should stop it. If you are doing uh, prophylactic uh, subcutaneous uh, um, heparin every 12 hours, then you can proceed. And then uh, if you are doing um, uh, more than 10,000, safety not established, if you are doing IV heparin, you should wait 60 minutes uh, uh, after instrumentation before administering uh, the heparin and uh, check the uh, uh, APTT. Uh, again, you will see it depends on the dose type and uh, uh, frequency. Now, um, this is a nice um, uh, illustration here to remind you where to place your catheter. So if you are doing a thoracic uh, surgery, then you should go with the upper uh, thoracic area. If you are doing upper abdominal surgery, then you should place it in the, uh, in the, sorry, this should be the middle, thoracic. And if you're doing lower abdomen surgery, then you should do lower thoracic. Um, again, this table give you, uh, this is this table from uh, Miller, and it gives you uh, roughly where you should place your catheter, like upper thoracic for thoracic surgery versus middle thoracic versus uh, uh, lower thoracic for abdominal surgery here. Uh, the site of introducing low, uh, first let's talk about that. So high thoracic epidural 
uh, anesthesia or analgesia, uh, a greater part uh, of local anesthetic spread caudally, while if you do low thoracic, usually mostly spread cranially. And that has to do with the curvature of the uh, spine. The site of introducing low thoracic uh, epidural should correspond approximately to the innervation of the center of the surgical incision. With high thoracic epidural, it should correspond with the innervation of the upper pool of the incision. Now, this uh, table summarizes um, the sensory level that need to be covered for uh, different surgeries, starting from hemorrhoidectomy, foot surgery, lower extremity surgery, hip surgery, lower abdomen, etc. This is another um, useful table as well. You can look at it. So it's uh, go over uh, assessment of epidural here. Let's say that I can have an epidural now. And so autonomic nerve blockade mainly uh, applied to sympathetic nerve blockade here, which is responsible for several potential benefits and side effects. So when you assess an epidural, it's very important to look at the blood pressure and uh, heart rate as well as respiratory uh, uh, function. Uh, sensory level, you need to determine the level and laterality, uh, usually by testing for temperature. Temperature with ice, uh, you, that's how you determine um, the level and um, it's very important because based on that, you will make a decision whether it's working, whether you need to do a top-up dose, uh, change your uh, infusion, and etc. And this is something you have to do uh, 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 frequently. Motor also uh, can be significantly affected, um, especially when you are using higher concentration. It's important to remember that motor blockade is usually two segments below the level of sensory blockade. This is very important. Um, and usually, when we assess for motor, we use the uh, PROMAGI uh, score, which is from three to zero, and three complete motor blockade. The patient unable to move either the feet or the knees, while PROMAGI 2, almost complete, the patient able to move feet only. PROMAGI 1 is partial, just able to move the knee. And PROMAGI uh, um, 0, uh, full flexion, as you see here, uh, of the knee and uh, feet. This is, again, an important table because it shows you what to expect. So let's say you did your assessment, you did your sensory assessment, and you realize that this patient fifth digit is covered. So that corresponds to C8. I hope you still remember from the dermatome slide. That means all your cardio uh, accelerator fiber is blocked. You are in trouble. Uh, inner aspect of the arm and forearm, some degree, um, apex of axilla, um, easy determined landmark, uh, nipple, T4, possible cardio accelerator uh, blockade, tip of z foil, that's a splanking fiber here. So if you are looking for a, a GI a benefit, remember the uh, lower uh, incidence of Elliot and and uh, and faster uh, return of bowel function, you should have a level up to T6, tip of Z4. Uh, Ampelicus T10, sympathetic nervous system to the leg. So if you're, if, if you are not there, if you are like here, and most likely you don't, you didn't, you did not get this plankton fiber. 
uh, inguinal ligament, uh, T12, and uh, if you just T12, then most likely you don't have any sympathetic nervous system blocked. Um, so this is important to keep in mind while we are assisting the patient and making decisions. Okay, here are uh, more helpful and uh, see you in part two. Please don't forget to subscribe.